some people who want to hear grief, who are already disciples of Aristotle. Aristotle says you have certain phlegm that you want, you have a, a surfeit of, huh? and you saturate it with it, and you want to get rid of it, and you go and see plays and hear stories to, 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 to get rid of this excess. Purge it, empathize and purge. There must be some part in the play or what. You say, oh my God, you sympathize. Poor girl, eh? She lost her job, her man, her mother, her leg, you know? No, oh, poor girl. But in the end, she won a lot too, or some damn <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's, that's the same theory of players. So these two girls must fit me all night. We love you. Beware of people. This is another aspect of this part of the talk. Who say what is apt? It's diplomacy is called apt. I will a diplomat, I can tell you. There are some guys who, by nature, say what's appropriate. Even though it's not the truth. You know? Even though it's not the truth. By nature, <coughs> they say what is appropriate. German ambassador in 1914 runs down to the Fidorsay in France, where they fall not. He says, look, Germany is going to mobilize against the Russians. What will France do if Germany mobilizes? The French minister says, France will be the best interest. He hasn't said a word. <laughs> we said something. Some people are good at that. Well, you and I might lose our temper out there. Some may ask you some crap about the seizures and the 400 people coming down. The Syrian people <coughs> down at the wolf on the fold down in Leesburg, the battering rams and all sorts of damn things. And then yeah, you, you, you fall for it. Some guys know what to say. Some don't. Some people shouldn't hold press conferences at all. They call it they don't know how to play the game. A press conference is a game of interpretation. It's a perception game. I hate it, press conference. Yeah, the guy asks a stupid question. We always do. And when you check it, the premises, the assumption in which the question is based is what you disagree with. The guy wouldn't ask you whether Lyndon Rouge is a new Nazi, he would turn to you and say, how could you support a man who hates the JDL? You see the cleverness? And if you fall for that, you end up saying you're a Nazi. It's the assumptions of a question. The hypothesis behind the question is always wrong. Now these two girls flattered the old man. You're a great guy. We love you. You know, so it had to be tendentious. Their remarks are tendentious. They're good diplomats. They're good con artists. They're good manipulators. They manipulate clear. And he gives her have one third. You your mind. Have one third. He turns to this daughter. He says, look, that's stupid. If I love you alone, I couldn't love my husband. Love must mean something different, you know. I can't tell you all oh, my love is yours. And so how do you love a husband? But that I have duties to you as a father, <coughs> study her answer. Her answer is, what are the different kinds of love? What is the meaning of the different kinds of love? That's what her answer is. God, he doesn't like that. My sometime daughter. She with her no. She didn't say the nice thing. Never said the nice thing. Look, I... He never forgot. So, so he gets angry and says, I give you nothing. Go your way. Now, King Henry the Eighth, like his son Edward, is done. He disliked his other daughter, Elizabeth, not disliked, less, let her less. Because she's the daughter of Anne Boland, because he had to cut off on Bolin's head, you know, she did to his belt. And uh, it's a bad memory for him. 
in it. And somehow he feel he felt his machismo, you know, what you call it now, was, was 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 destroyed by handball. After all I've done for you, you know, you still don't commit adultery. I mean, I gave up the first queen, I married you, you know, made you queen queen and of England and all that, and you still commit adultery. Her excuse, of course, is the banal one that you find in the Bergen record all the time. Um, yeah, but you always go on hunting and left me alone. You know, what must I do when you are gone hunting? You know? Yeah. There are men who will hunt me. So, that's the first thesis I want to get to get. That's what the <laughs> face is So, what happens? See, I'm going to keep a hundred nights. And I retain the crown. Issue. Should power exist in a vacuum? Or should power have a relationship to something temporal? There. Should you, suppose now you have a movement. Should you make Joe Jones top dog in the movement with no power? You can't call a meeting. You can't do that. You can't say, but he's the top dog. You know? Or should Joe Jones have some physical power related to the movement? Do you want substance or shadow? What's important says she experienced substance, not shadow. The shadow of power is nonsense. What's the point of keeping a mere sign if you're a king of Britain? A hundred nights we carouse and we dance and sing and all that. But the real power is to be these girls. It took the one thought he was to be for the year. Made a half and half between Reagan and the That's the second issue. Very, very important indeed. <laughs> because you know what? I'll give you a lot of it. Well, I can give you the map industry. Uh, you may not know, but Woodrow Wilson in his second term was very ill. And his wife ran America. His wife right in America. Up to 1920. <laughs> then, of course, we were in those guys to go on part of that. Harding. She was the eminence behind the throne. And there was a Scots guy who used to wear uh, tartans and what have you. <laughs> who used to handle the Queen Victoria after Albert died. There are players about this and movies about it. But he was the power behind the throne. And the real power. And if you think Josephine was a mayor in Pavania walking behind the parliament and the one of your mind. They had their exits and their exits. Anyway, substance. He gave up substance and kept shot. <coughs> Deal of substance. Get shot. That produces chaos, says Shakespeare. Now, paganism. There's a pagan. What's a pagan? The word pagan comes from Latin. Paganus. means rustic. Rustic. What happened was when Christianity came to the Roman Empire, it was largely centered in urban areas. See? So the non-Christian parts of the country were in rustic rural areas. So the habit developed of saying, oh, Pagani, you know, not Christian. I mean, the, the rustics. The word pagan ended up meaning uh, that you were uh, not a believer in a particular god or any gods. You had several gods. So pagan means, nowadays, that you believe in several gods. Jupiter, Hecate, Apollo, you name it. Yeah? And his first name, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tons, Rolado, a lot of gods exist in 
I need my MTV. You've seen it. You've seen these guys. So, Edmund's an infidel. An infidel, I'm telling you, Edmund's story just now. Infidel is Latin again, infidelis means unfaithful. An infidel is someone is merely someone who is unfaithful to a particular religion. So to a Christian, a Muslim is an infidel. Not faithful to Christianity. And to a Muslim, a Christian is an infidel, it's not faithful to So that's all infidel means. And Edmund's problem is bastardy. And Shakespeare raises all this custom. Natural. I tell you that he got the story of Edmund from Sir Philip Sidney, who wrote something called Arcadia. Sir Philip Sidney was the famous gentleman who reported, but he was a good agent, too. When he fought a battle and somebody was dying, he had water, he gave him famous to give the guy water. Wounded man said, Thy knee is a bit of a mind. That's the <coughs> idea of gentility. Raleigh like spreading his cloak, you know. Those are the two stories he told where they saw chivalry. Sidney so giving the dying man his water. He was dying too. And Raleigh spreading his cloak. So the queen or whoever it was was a problem. Uh, Edmund was a bastard son of the Earl of Gloucester. By custom, in every class society, this class of bastards are treated badly. It's a hard thing because bastards have no seen their own origin. Mm -hmm. So the issue by custom, you see, I tell you, I tell you how bad English law up this moment is. If I'm married, I have three, as I do, I have three daughters. If I have a bastard son, say his name is Oscar, I can't say I leave all my property to my children and he gets, gets nothing. For him to get something, I have to say, and to my son Oscar, born of, identify him in particular. See? Or else he wouldn't get. Bastards are penalized. If you die without a will, he's not next of kin. Only the legal children are next of kin. See? That's how the English law runs. And American law, the last English law, can tell you that. You, know, you don't inherit either. Bastards are still being left. Bastards, you never have a father. A father in, in, in the law, in America and Britain is called a putative father, whatever that means. Puto is to think. So, a uh, what my my uh, body used to say, mother is a fact, and father is a faith. <laughs> you know you know which womb you came from. You don't know who put it there. Huh? Yes, sir, put it there. Anyway, Edmund is a bastard. And by custom, bastards were treated badly. And the so called common law, which is the basic law of Britain and America, is a customary law of Anglo Saxon. Issue. What happens when custom contravenes natural law? Natural law is a body of principle that told you about this. It exists. It says mankind, like other things in the world, the universe, are processes. And they have a right to come into existence, survive, grow, and develop. And anything inconsistent with that is against natural law. Natural law says that we don't give a damn how this how, how this woman came to make this son. But he's here. You know. Marriage is a security arrangement in society. You know, so you can say, well, look, hey, she's married to him, so you don't mess around. Identification. And the ceremony is evidence. So take that's not that, that's what before they had writing, you know. But there's anything nonsense of the writing of the paper, and the Chinese invented paper, it's 
you had to have a big ceremony so people could know. So if you're in some village somewhere, and I'm going to marry St. G, you make a big deal out of it. Big sport and how many pigs and sheep. So later on, somebody says, but isn't Jean married friend? Yes, I remember. I remember when they had a big ceremony. It was evidential. The ceremony was evidential. He goes, no, I'll just put on the white veil, even though I'm pregnant. And give me two rings and I'll give you a ring. That's balls. Nothing to do with that. Now that we have better methods of recording, you don't need all that. But still you get this nonsense, ten brides with it, huh? five little boys dressed in like Philip Morris and one is in the middle. Who's not so good? How are you? He said? Oh, yes, well, listen. Uh, yes. So, but you get this. A uh, guy goes on television, I got three daughters and I'm saving for when they get married. He goes spend, you know. He has a special account at Citibank or some such thing. And he's going to do this and do that and bore his head and this and wine and tomorrow and they all broke. <laughs> you know, all marriage meant was that there is a legal recognition 